Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on fiduciary reporting. John DeBarro and Jennifer Ripka are the presenters. You are joined in listen-only mode, however you want your participation. If you have questions, please type them in the question window. I will monitor them and share them with our presenters. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, Wrenching Down GASB 84, The Nuts and Bolts of Fiduciary Reporting. My name is Jennifer Ripka, and I'm joined by John DeBurro. We're audit partners in our government practice at Weaver, a firm dedicated to serving federal, state, and local governments. John and I are both located in the Dallas, Texas office. Now I'm gonna turn it over to John so that he can discuss today's objectives. Thank you, Jennifer. And welcome everyone to our webinar, Wrenching Down GASB 84, the Nuts and Bolts of Fiduciary Reporting, uh, the first in our series of uh, GASB pronouncements that we'll go through. Uh, there are a number of things that we'd like to go through with you this afternoon. And today's topics will include a background on GASB 84. Many of you probably are familiar with GASB 84, but I'm sure that some aren't. So I'd like to start by giving you a background on GASB 84 and how it came to be. Then we'll jump into really the nuts and bolts of GASB 84 because it really focuses on two things, how to identify fiduciary activities and how to report fiduciary activities. Along the way, we'll talk about various implementation considerations. GASB recently issued a uh, GASB 84 specific implementation guide and we'll talk about the guide itself and give several examples, many of which emanate from the implementation guide. And we'll also talk about creating a game plan for implementation of GASB 84. Jennifer, our first polling question. Okay, we're gonna launch our very first audience poll question. What type of entity do you work for? A, a city or school district, B, a state government, C, a county or other governmental entity, or D, a public accounting firm? We'll wait a few seconds to get everyone's submissions. We have the results. Looks like the majority of you work for cities or school districts. Okay, good. It's nice to know who we're speaking with this afternoon. And as I mentioned, I want to kick things off, giving you a little bit of background on GASB 84 and how it came to be. As many of you are aware, GASB has issued very many pronouncements over the past decade or two. And you're probably wondering why fiduciary activities, why another pronouncement? Well, really, this stemmed from a couple of different things. GASB had been looking at financial statements for several years and noticed a lot of inconsistencies, both in what governments were reporting as fiduciary activities and how they were reporting them. And really this uh, also came about from uh, GASB 45 being replaced with GASB 67 and 74 and questions that came out of the changes there. Uh, but really, they realized the previous guidance, which stemmed from NCGA 1, GASB 14 is later amended by GASB 61 and GASB 34, that they didn't sufficiently define fiduciary responsibilities and what constitutes fiduciary activities. We all knew that we needed to report fiduciary activities, but really it wasn't very clearly defined. So GASB developed Statement 84 to do a couple things. They wanted to enhance consistency, but also enhance comparability by defining specific criteria to identify and report the fiduciary activities. The standard is effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15th of 2018. So that will be fiscal year 2020 for all of those. So let's uh, start off talking about the beginning of GASB 84 and how to identify fiduciary activities. And this next slide I like because it gives you a visible representation of how to identify fiduciary activities. 
And what it does, it presents two questions. And based on your answer to the two questions, it will create four paths for making the determination of whether or not you have a fiduciary activity, each path with separate criteria. And those two questions are, are the assets held by a component unit and are the assets held for pension or OPEB arrangements? And as I mentioned, based on your answers to those two questions, it will create four different paths, each one with separate criteria. And isn't this going to be very important when we're going through the examples a little bit later? Yes, it will be, Jennifer. Uh, and let's start off, first of all, by talking about component units, because the first question is, are the assets held by component units? And for most of us, I don't think we deal with component unit determination on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's probably good to have a refresher on component unit determination. And for those of you who don't deal with this topic on a daily basis, in order to have component units, the first thing we have to have is a legally separate organization. And then we also need to be able to show financial accountability. And that can be done one of three ways. The first of which is that the government has to appoint a voting majority of the governing body of that organization and be able to impose its will on that organization. The second way of showing financial accountability is if the government appoints a voting majority of the governing body of that organization and has either a financial benefit or burden relationship with that organization. And the third way of showing financial accountability is to have both fiscal dependency and a financial benefit or burden relationship. This next slide just gives you again a visual representation of what I just talked about, that the path to component unit determination starts with determining whether we have a legally separate organization. And if we do, then the next step in determining a component unit is to find out whether we appoint the voting majority of that organization's governing body. If we say yes to that question, then we go on and see whether there is a financial benefit or burden relationship or whether we can impose our will on that organization. If we answer yes to one of those, then we have a component unit. At the same time, if we said no, that we don't appoint the voting majority, we can still have a component unit, but we have to meet the criteria of fiscal dependency and have a financial benefit or burden relationship with that organization. So we've mentioned a lot of concepts here in component unit determination, and there are a few things I'd like to go over. I mentioned the concept of legally separate, and something to point out is with GASB 84, it notes that pension and OPEB arrangements administered through trusts under GASB 67 and 74 are considered legally separate from the government. And that's pointed out in paragraph seven of GASB 84, which states that such plans are generally legally separate. And this is regardless of whether it's a defined benefit plan or a defined contribution plan. And I'd like to call your attention to implementation guide questions 4.1, 0.2, and 0.3 that have specific examples that go through this concept of legally separate and whether it's a defined benefit or contribution plan. I also talked about imposition of will. And for those of you who don't recall what constitutes imposition of will, this really exists if the government can significantly influence the programs, pro projects, or activities performed. And that comes from GASB Statement 14. And examples of imposition of will showing that it exists are things such as having the ability to remove appointed members of the governing board of that organization at will, if the government has the ability to modify or approve that organization's budget, having the ability to modify or approve rates or fee changes, having the ability to veto, overrule, or modify decisions of the governing body of that organization, and finally, if they have the ability to appoint, hire, reassign, or dismiss members of management of that organization, then they have the imposition of will. <laughs> 
with regards to financial benefit or burden, this can be established if any of the following conditions exist. The first of which is if the government is legally entitled to or can otherwise access that organization's resources, then there is a financial benefit relationship. If the government is legally obligated or has otherwise assumed the obligation to finance a deficit or provide financial support to that organization, then there's a financial burden relationship. And I want to just mention for a moment on this particular criteria that this is the one that we will talk about in just a few moments with regards to GAD 84 especially when it comes into play with uh, looking at plans, OPEB and pension plans, as to whether or not they are component units. And the third criteria is the uh, government being obligated in some manner for the debt of the organization that would create a financial benefit burden relationship. And the final concept that we mentioned during component unit determination is that of fiscal dependency. And GASB 14 states that this exists if the government has the ability to do any of the following. The first being approve or modify the organization's budget. The second is approve the organization's tax levy rates or other charges. And again, I wanna spend just a moment to emphasize this second item because when it comes to application of GASB 84, fiscal dependency isn't going to be generated just by approving contribution rates, but rather than effectively setting the rates. The third criteria is if the government can approve the organization's bond issuances. I'd also like to note that in determining whether a pension or OPEB plan is a component unit, paragraph seven, as I mentioned, indicates that a primary government is considered to have a financial burden if it's legally obligated or has assumed the obligation to make contributions to the plan. So this is quite a change from what we had prior to GAD 84, where making a contribution was seen more of an exchange transaction, but now they're telling us that it rises to the level of financial burden. So now it's very likely that the key criteria in determining whether a plan is a component unit may be whether the government appoints the voting majority of a, the pension or OPEB board, therefore the financial accountability would be met. It can also be met if there's fiscal dependency. And I'd call your attention to implementation guide question 4.7, which talks about this subject of financial burden and how that's met if the government is making contributions to the plan. So now that we've gone through a little bit of um, component unit determination 101, let's actually look at the various paths that are created by the answers to our questions. And the first one, is one where we said, yes, we have a component unit holding the assets and that yes, we have post-employment benefits. And in this situation, these arrangements can be fiduciary if they're one of the following two arrangements. The first of which is a pension or OPEB plan that's administered through a trust that meets the criteria in paragraph three of either Gadsby's statement 67 for pensions or 74 for OPEB. And if you recall, the criteria of paragraph three of 67 are that the contributions have to be irrevocable, the plan assets have to be dedicated to providing benefits to the beneficiaries, and the plan assets have to be legally protected from the creditors. The second arrangement is that assets from entities that are not part of the reporting entity are being accumulated for pensions or OPEB as described in specific criteria of either statement 73 for pensions or 74 for OPEB. This next slide is just, again, a visual representation of what I just mentioned, the three criteria of paragraph three of both GASB statement 67 and 74, which are irrevocable contributions, plan assets being dedicated to providing benefits to the intended beneficiaries, plan assets being legally protected from the creditors of the government. So Jennifer, let's uh, go through a few examples. Okay, for the very first example, the city establishes a single employer defined benefit pension plan. 
that plan assets are held in a qualifying trust, the employer makes contributions per the agreements, and the city does not approve the plan's budget, nor do they set the contribution requirement. There's no plan board for this example. Is it considered to be a component unit? And is it a fiduciary activity? Okay, great. Well, let's look at the criteria that we've talked about. Since this is a fiduciary component unit and involves pension and OPEB, we look first to see if it's considered to be a component unit. And looking at the criteria for component unit determination, we first of all look to see if it's a legally separate organization. And yes, we said that it is held in a qualifying trust, so it is legally separate. Then we look to see if we appoint the voting majority. And well, we have a bit of an issue there because there is no board for the plan. So I'm not really sure about that. Why don't we get back to that and go down to the next question first to see if we meet any of those. When we look at the financial benefit or burden criteria, we can say, yes, we do make contributions to the plan. So the financial burden criteria has been met of financial accountability. And can we meet it through fiscal dependency? No, we don't set the rates. So uh, we don't meet the fiscal dependency criteria. So we have to go back and determine whether we appoint the voting majority because that's the only way we're gonna have a component in it here. And what happens here is in the implementation guide question 4.5, Gasby tells us that in scenarios like this, if the government's governing body steps into the role of the governing body of the plan if they do things such as establishing vesting requirements setting the rates things that the governing board of that organization the plan would do then they're in essence stepping into that role and they therefore appoint the voting majority of the board for application of GASB 84. so in this case the criteria of voting majority and financial burden are met so we do have financial accountability we do have a component unit and we do have a fiduciary activity let's look at another example okay in this next example the city establishes a single employer defined benefit pension plan it has a seven member board five of those members are appointed by the city one is elected by the retired plan members and one is elected by active plan members the plan assets are held in a qualifying trust and the employees as well as the employer both contribute to the plan is it considered to be a component unit and then is it a fiduciary activity okay thanks jennifer once again we'll go through the criteria of a component unit the first of which is legally separate. And our answer there is yes, it is legally separate because the assets are held in a qualifying trust. Then we ask whether we appoint the voting majority. We said that we appoint five of the seven members. So yes, we appoint the voting majority. And then we can ask whether there's a financial benefit or burden relationship. And our answer again is yes, we know that the city contributes to the plan. Therefore, that criteria is met. And therefore we've met both criteria necessary for financial accountability and we have a legally separate organization. So yes, we have a component unit and yes, we have fiduciary activity. Let's look at another example. Okay. In this next example, the city establishes a single employer defined contribution pension plan. The plan has a seven member board, three are appointed by the city, two are elected by the retired plan members, and two are elected by active plan members. The plan assets are held in a qualifying trust. The employees as well as the employer both contribute. The city approves the plan's budget as well as sets the contribution rates. Is it considered to be a component unit and is it a fiduciary activity? Okay, thanks Jennifer. Well, let's analyze this situation. This one, when we first of all look to see if we have a component unit and ask if it's a legally separate organization, the answer again is yes, because the assets are held in a qualifying trust. Then we go to whether or not we appoint the voting majority. 
And the answer is no, we only appoint three of the seven members, so we don't appoint the voting majority. And therefore, two of the three possibilities of showing financial accountability are closed. So the only way that we can show financial accountability and determine whether we have a component unit is to look at both financial benefit and burden and fiscal dependency. So when we look at whether there's a financial benefit or burden relationship, we can answer yes to that. The city contributes to the plan. And then when we look at fiscal dependency, we're also able to say yes, because it was stated that the city sets the rates for the plan. And by setting the rates, they show fiscal dependency. So since both financial benefit and burden and fiscal dependency are met, there's financial accountability. Therefore, we have a component unit and fiduciary activity. And at this point, I'd like to just discuss this a little further because there are a lot of different types of situations of plans that we can have here. And GASB also talks about a, a situation in which we have a multi-employer defined benefit plan and what would happen as far as fiscal dependency. And in speaking with Lisa Parker from the GASB recently, uh, she pointed out an example su such as this and trying to determine fiscal dependency. And initially, it was thought that if you approve the rates, that that would meet fiscal dependency. But if you think about it for a minute, if you're in a multi-employer plan and each employer is approving the rates, then each employer would be able to show this as a component unit, which is not what is meant under the standard. So therefore, the only organization that would be able to report the plan as a component unit is if one of the members establishes, sets the rates for all of the other members, then you would have fiscal dependency in that situation. Okay, I think we've spent quite a bit of time looking at the first path. Let's go down the second path. And this is one in which we say yes, that the assets are held by a component unit, but no, they do not provide post-employment benefits. These arrangements can be fiduciary if they have at least one of the following characteristics. And the first of which is a situation in which we have assets that are held in a trust or equivalent arrangement in which the government is not a beneficiary. The assets have to be dedicated to providing benefits to the recipients in accordance with the benefit terms and legally protected from creditors. The second situation is one in which we have assets that are for the benefit of individuals and the government doesn't have what's known as administrative involvement or direct financial involvement with the assets. And we'll talk about what that means in just a moment. And the third situation is one in which assets are for the direct benefit of organizations or other governments that are not part of the reporting entity. One thing to point out as well is in these last two situations, the assets can't be derived from the provision of goods or services by the government to the individuals, governments, or organizations. So we mentioned administrative involvement and direct financial involvement. And thankfully, GASB has defined both of these concepts for us. When it comes to administrative involvement, GASB tells us that there are three examples of what constitutes administrative involvement. The first is a situation in which the government is monitoring compliance with requirements of the activity that are established by the government. So maybe we have a situation in which the government has scholarships that are being granted and the government is granting the scholarships, they're determining the criteria for the scholarships and they're monitoring compliance with those requirements. So in essence, they have administrative involvement in this situation, and it would not be considered a fiduciary activity. The second example of administrative involvement is one in which the government is determining eligible expenditures that are established by the government. And this could be a situation in which the government has very specific uh, requirements for eligible expenditures. Maybe it's a school district that has cre created specific spending requirements and they're monitoring the compliance with these eligible expenditure requirements. That could be construed as administrative involvement and that would preclude them from having fiduciary activities in that situation. The third 
example of administrative involvement would be a situation in which the government has the ability to exercise discretion in how assets are allocated. The other term that we mentioned, direct financial involvement, Gatsby also gives us an example of what constitutes this. And that would be a situation in which the government provides matching resources for the activity. So maybe there are uh, student clubs in a, in a school district and the district is providing matching resources for the activity that would be seen as direct financial involvement. And again, that would preclude you from showing there's a fiduciary activity. I think we're set for our next poll. Okay, what does not constitute administrative involvement under GASB 84? A, monitoring compliance with requirements of activities established by the government. B, having the ability to exercise discretion in how the assets are allocated. C, providing accounting control over the activity. Or D, determining eligible expenditures that are established by the government. Okay, if we can get the results. And it looks like 44% of you selected providing accounting control over the activity, which is correct. Okay, yeah, that's right. Providing accounting control of the activity would not constitute administrative control. And that's something that came up here in Texas recently when GADB 84 came out and we were having initial discussions as to whether Texas uh, independent school districts had administrative control in their situations that would require uh, student activity funds to be re reported as governmental funds rather than as fiduciary activities. And in examining this, the Texas Education Agency and GASB uh, looked at the situation in which uh, faculty advisors uh, sometimes are involved in approving or rejecting expenditures for student activity funds, but the activities themselves have their own uh, general standards of what is eligible and what's not. It's not a situation in which the school district is setting specific criteria for the spending, and therefore it was looked at that the faculty advisor was not really using their discretion, but basically just being a good steward of uh, and acting as an accounting control. So that it was determined that this was not an administrative control, um, but was actually an accounting control, that, which did not preclude it from being a fiduciary activity here. It may be a different situation in different states and could actually be a different situation in some situations for districts here as well. But uh, that's good that the majority of people uh, answered correctly. Let's go into the, the next path. And this is going to be a situation in which we don't have component units, but we do have post-employment benefits. And one thing that you're going to notice on these final two paths is that the biggest change here is for fiduciary activities to exist under these two paths is that the government has to have control of the assets. That's really the big determining factor here. So in situations of post-employment benefits with no component units holding the assets, the government has to control the assets and the arrangement has to be one of the following. And you'll notice that the two arrangements are the, the same two that we saw in the first path of determination either a pension or OPEB plan administered through a trust that meets the specified criteria of GADB 67 for pension or 74 for OPEB or assets from entities that are not part of the reporting entity being accumulated for pension or OPEB under specified criteria of 73 or 74. But again, the biggest difference is the fact that the government has to have control of the assets. Okay, and so you've talked a lot about control, but let's discuss what you really mean by control. Sure. 
Well, let's go through what GASB 84 has told us is control. It's something that I think we, we can kind of see what it is, but they've actually defined it for us. And really there are two different have to have the ability to direct the use, exchange, or employment of those assets in a manner that provides the benefits to the intended beneficiary. So maybe you have given the resources to a trust. So they're being held in a trust, not in your government's name, but you've maybe signed an agreement that gives you the authority to invest those assets in a certain manner. You can direct the use, exchange, or employment of those assets then you still have control of those assets for purposes of determining fiduciary activities. One thing that GASB also points out here is that external restrictions on the use of assets don't preclude the government from having control of the assets. So that brings us to our next poll. Okay, the next polling question is true or false? The control criteria is applicable when determining whether a component unit is a fiduciary component unit. And the results are 89% said true. The answer is actually false. So John, will you go through sure. the reasoning behind that? Yeah, the, uh, the question again was, the control criteria is applicable when determining whether a component unit is a fiduciary component unit. The reason the answer is false is as I mentioned, under the first two paths, the assets are held by a component unit and therefore the control criteria doesn't come into play. The control criteria only comes into play when we're not dealing with a component unit. So it's essential that the government has control of the assets in order for there to be a fiduciary activity. Okay, we've gone through three paths of fiduciary activity determination. Now let's look at the final path. And this is the path that I call the all other path because we're looking at situations in which there's uh, non-component unit activities and non-pension, non-OPEB situations. So all other can be fiduciary, but they need to meet all three of the following criteria. The first of which is the government controls the assets. And I think we've all seen what that means. The second criteria is that the assets are not derived either solely from the government's own source revenues, from government mandated or voluntary non-exchange transactions with the exception of pass-through grants. Or the third criteria is one that we saw before in the component unit situation in which the assets have to be one of the following, either administered through a trust or equivalent arrangement and the government itself is not a beneficiary, with the assets dedicated to providing benefits to the recipients and legally protected from creditors. They can also be for the benefit of individuals and the government doesn't have administrative involvement or direct financial involvement, or the assets can be for the benefit of organizations or other governments that are not part of the financial reporting entity. So I mentioned the concept of own source revenues and what are they? This is something that I think when, when people hear the term, they know what it is. It's something that you see it and you pretty much know what it is. But GASB has gone a little bit further and given us uh, a definition or examples of what constitutes own source revenues. And basically they state that own source revenues are revenues that are generated by the government itself. And I, I really think that it's, something that if, if you see it, if it looks like government revenues, then it probably is. They give examples 
of exchange and exchange-like revenues, things such as water and sewer charges and investment incomes, any kind of charges for service of the government. But they also mentioned that it includes things such as derived tax revenues. So sales taxes, maybe income taxes, if you have them in your state, impose non-exchange revenues such as property taxes and fines and for forfeiture fees. So that being the case, let's go to our next poll, please. All right, the next polling question is, which of the following are own source resources? A, property taxes, B, sales taxes, C, water and sewer charges, or D, all of the above? and we'll go ahead and get the results. 81% of you said all of the above, which is correct. Great, I'm glad everyone was paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> yes, property taxes, sales taxes, water and sewer charges all constitute own source revenues. And as I mentioned, if it feels like a government revenue, it probably is a revenue to the government and own source revenues will uh, preclude you from reporting it as a fiduciary activity, as you would imagine. So we've got a series of examples that we'd like to go through that uh, center on this final path of the all other uh, fiduciary activity scenarios. So why don't we start off with the, the first one, Jennifer. Okay. The city uses a clearing account to accumulate withholdings of employee payroll deductions and payroll, accrued payroll taxes. The withholdings are recorded as liabilities in the city's clearing account, a payroll withholding fund. Can the city consider the fund a fiduciary activity and report it in the fiduciary fund's financial statements? Well, I remember years ago when I used to see some governmental entities that would record these situations in a fiduciary fund, uh, not so much anymore. But anyway, now that there's a framework for making the determination, uh, Gasby thought that it was important to include this as an implementation guide question, which is implementation guide question 4.15. And again, using the framework, we can go through this now in the all other situation. And first of all, we look to see if, if we have control. And yes, the resources are in a, um, in a bank account under the custody of the government. We look to see if they're not derived from own source revenues. And yes, they are not derived from own source revenues. The next criteria being not derived from government mandated or voluntary non-exchange transactions. And we can answer yes to that. But when we look at that last series of criteria under all other and whose benefit the assets are being held for, they're not being held for the individual. They're not being held for other governments or organizations. They're really held for the benefit of the government itself. Because if you think about it, the government has already paid the employees their salaries. And what's left for resources are to pay the liabilities that are remaining, that are the obligation of the government. So they're being held for the benefit of the government itself. And therefore, we don't have a fiduciary activity in this situation. Instead, the resources would be reported in either a governmental or enterprise fund. So what's our next example? In this next example, a county has custody of resources pursuant to a non-trust agreement with a nonprofit organization to provide accounting and treasury services. The nonprofit is legally separate and does not meet criteria to be included as a component unit of the county. Should the accounting and treasury activity provided to the nonprofit be included in the county's fiduciary fund financial statements? Thanks, Jennifer. A couple things I'd like to point out here before we go through it is that this example uh, stems from implementation guide questions 4.29 and 4.30. And it wasn't very clear in the guide, but just to point out, in this situation, the county has custody of the resources, but it's not in exchange for providing accounting and treasury services. They're holding those resources in the fiduciary capacity, and 
uh, providing the treasury services to invest those resources, but not in exchange for providing the accounting and treasury services. So when we look at this example and we go through the various criteria of determination, the first we look at is that of control. And our answer is yes, the county has custody of the resources. We look at whether or not uh, the resources are derived from own source revenues. And we can say, yes, they're not derived from own source revenues. When we look at whether or not they're derived from government mandated or voluntary non-exchange transactions, we can answer yes to that, that they're not derived from those. And when we look at whether or not the resources are for the benefit of organizations and not part of the financial reporting entity, we can also answer that as yes, because it was pointed out in the example that it was not part of the county. Uh, it was not meeting the criteria of component units. So it's for the benefit of an organization that's not part of the reporting entity. And therefore, yes, it should be reported in the county's fiduciary fund financial statements. All right, with this next example, the county collects property taxes on behalf of other governments. Taxes are deposited in property tax distribution fund, a custodial fund. The county also collects a fee, 1% of the amount billed for providing the service. Can the county report the fees in the property tax distribution fund? Okay, this is a good example as well, and it's a very realistic example that comes from implementation guide question 4.38. And in this situation, we're talking about whether the fees can be reported in the fiduciary funds. And we look first at control. We have control because the assets are in the county bank account. Are they not derived from own source revenues? When we ask that question, the answer is no. So immediately, we conclude that this is not a fiduciary activity. And that's specific to the fees that we're collecting because the fees that we're collecting are actually an exchange transaction. We're exchanging the fees for the services that we're providing to the cities for collecting the taxes. So no, the fees cannot be reported in fiduciary fund financial statements. They must be reported in governmental funds or enterprise funds. But obviously, the taxes that are collected themselves are a fiduciary activity and can be reported in fiduciary fund financial statements. And okay. one final example. In this last example, Weaver University was given $20,000 by an alumnus to establish a scholarship fund. Weaver University holds the assets in a bank account in Weaver University's name. Weaver University selects the scholarship recipient and monitors the compliance with the scholarship requirements. Weaver University is allowed to spend the corpus as well as the interest. Can Weaver University report the scholarship fund as a fiduciary fund? Okay, let's take a look at this against the criteria that are established and initially we'll look at it and we have control, we have the resources, we then ask uh, whether the resources are not derived from own source revenues, and we can answer yes there. When we go to the next set of criteria, not derived from government mandated or voluntary non-exchange transactions, uh, the answer is no, because these are voluntary non-exchange transactions. But even if we went further down to the next set of criteria and looked at whether the assets are held for benefits of individuals and the government does not have administrative or direct financial involvement, our answer is no there because we've already established that Weaver University has administrative involvement because they're awarding the scholarships, they're determining the criteria for the scholarships and monitoring compliance with those requirements, which fits the definition of administrative involvement. So our conclusion then is that this is not a fiduciary activity and should be reported in either governmental funds or in business type activities. So just a, a few other things to throw out there. Uh, there are many, many examples in the implementation guide. This is a specific implementation guide to GADB 84 fiduciary activities. But just to talk about a, a couple other things that they have for examples in there, implementation guide Question 4.16, for example, is intended to clarify whether assets are held for the benefit of individuals or organizations. And just to kind of paraphrase here, in, in that example, the question 
uh, is one in which there's a chess club of a public high school, and it's not a legally separate organization from the high school. The proceeds used for fundraising activities, and they're held in a separate bank account in the school's name. But in determining whether those resources are controlled by the school and whether they're fiduciary, they have to look at whether the benefits accrue to the individuals that comprise the organization or that the club, or whether they accrue to the organization itself, the government itself. So here, um, the club is not legally separate from the primary government. So in this situation, the benefits are actually accruing to the individual. So when they make a determination here, they're going to have to look at the criteria for assets that are held for the benefit of individuals and look at things such as the administrative involvement or direct financial involvement. Some other question and answer examples in the implementation guide focus on situations uh, clarifying situations in which the government has administrative or direct financial involvement, and one of which is Implementation Guide 20, and I kind of alluded to it earlier during one of our examples, uh, a situation in which a school district holds funds for various student activity funds. There's no school board or school administrative policy in this particular example, and they have a faculty advisor that can approve, reject, or modify uh, the various spending of, of these disbursements at the discretion of the faculty advisor. And in that particular implementation guide question, the answer is yes, the school district has administrative involvement. But I just wanted to clarify again that this is a situation in which there is no, uh, there may be no specific school district spending criteria, but there's also no specific spending criteria for the individual uh, clubs. So in that situation, the advisor is uh, left to their discretion of approval, rejection, or modification of the, the spending. So really, this could uh, vary quite a bit from, from state to state and, and how specific uh, each school's spending policies are. They don't want to have this come up that general spending policies constitute administrative involvement, things such as not spending things on illegal things like alcohol. That's just a general policy, but not a specific policy. So again, this example could really vary from state to state and situation to situation. Okay, now we spent quite a bit of time talking about fiduciary activity uh, identification. The other part that 84 really focuses on is reporting of fiduciary activities. And we have four different types of fiduciary funds under GASB 84. The first three really haven't changed. We have pension and OPEB trust funds, which include those administered through trusts under GASB 67 and 74, as well as employee benefit plans for which resources are held in trust and the contributions are irrevocable. We have investment trust funds, which often include the external portion of investment pools held in trust. And we have private purpose trust funds, which are really a catch-all for all fiduciary activities that are held in a trust that aren't required to be in either a pension or OPEB trust fund or investment trust fund. And the final fiduciary fund type is called custodial funds. And this replaces agency funds uh, Agency funds will exist no more. Instead, we'll have custodial funds, and they will be used to report fiduciary activities that are not held in trust. So again, GASB 84 has given us new definitions for the first three types of trust funds, pension and OPEB, investment, trust funds, and private purpose trust funds. And really, what underlies these is there has to be a trust agreement or equivalent arrangement to have one of these three arrangements. There are no more agency funds, custodial funds will be used for situations in which there's no trust or equivalent arrangement. GASB's given us some ideas, uh, some examples of custodial funds. They could be used for situations involving things such as student activity funds, maybe a county clerk funds that are not held in a trust, city fundraising for various organizations. And unlike agency funds, Custodial funds have a measurement focus, and that's a big change from 
agency funds. Because they have a measurement focus, you're now going to have to report a statement of changes in fiduciary net position in your basic financial statements. And no longer will it always be a situation in which assets equal liabilities because they could be net position involving custodial funds. This next slide just gives you a visual representation that shows you that all four of the fiduciary fund types now will report a statement of fiduciary net position as well as a statement of changes in fiduciary net position. And Gasby goes uh, into a little bit of the statement of fiduciary net position, going through a few things for us. And the first thing that they talk about is when to report a liability to beneficiaries. This is in situations that don't involve pension or OPEB trust funds because they have specific criteria in GASB 67 and 74 to follow. But for all other situations, you report a liability to beneficiaries when an event occurs that compels the government to disperse those resources. And that can be one of a couple different situations. Obviously, it could be a situation in which a demand has been made. So a demand has been formally made for those resources. So that compels the government to disperse them. But it can also involve a situation in which no further action is required. There's no approval or anything required by the beneficiary. And I go back to the example that we talked about a few minutes ago in which the county collects taxes for the cities. So the county would record the liability when it collects the taxes on behalf of the cities because there's no further action required by the cities to receive those resources. With regards to liabilities other than those to beneficiaries, GAB 84 points out that we would recognize those in accordance with existing standards. Okay, I think we have one final example that we'd like to go through with. In this example, the city parks department sponsors youth soccer program. This program is run by volunteer coaches and not the employees of the city. Participants pay a fee for uniforms that are kept in a city bank account. The city determines that arrangement meets criteria of the custodial fund under GASB 84. Should the city recognize a liability for the expected uniform purchases when the resources are received? Okay, great. Again, this example uh, comes from the implementation guide generally and uh, comes from implementation guide question 4.47. And when we look at this, really it comes down to whether the city is compelled to disperse the funds. And the answer is no, the city is not compelled to disperse the funds at the time they receive the fee from the participants. They're not compelled to disperse those funds until the uniforms are actually acquired by the coaches and therefore a liability is created. So the city will report net position for the difference between the resources received and any liabilities incurred. They haven't incurred a liability here, so instead, as the resources are received, they will become additions that will be reported in the statement of changes in fiduciary net position, and they will increase fiduciary net position. A few other things to throw out there with regard to reporting fiduciary activities in the statement of changes in net fiduciary net position, GASB tells us that you should disaggregate additions by source, including investment earnings, investment costs, and net investment earnings. With regards to deductions, they should also be dis disaggregated by type. And if you have administrative costs, display those separately as well. And they also point out that for custodial funds only, if the resources are generally held only three months or less, you're allowed to report a single aggregated amount for additions as well as a single aggregated amount for deductions, so long as the descriptions are adequate to indicate the nature of the flows. You don't need to go out and remeasure this every year. It's more of a judgment call, but if they are held three months or less, then that's an option for you. GASB 84 also talks about business type activities, noting that they should generally report fiduciary activities in a separate fiduciary fund financial statement. However, GASB gives them an out and states that in situations in which uh, assets and corresponding liabilities in the statement of net position can be reported rather than reporting them in a custodial fund if the assets are normally expected to be held three months or less. So you do have that option. And if you take the option to report an asset and a corresponding liability, 
in the statement in that position of the business type activities, you would also separately report additions and deductions if they were significant as cash inflows and outflows in the operating activities section of the statement of cash flows. I mentioned already the implementation guide issued in June of 2019. I highly recommend that you go through the questions and answers. There are a lot of situations which may mirror your situation. And when planning for implementation, there are several things to consider. First of all, consider the fact that funds that were previously fiduciary could now be considered governmental or enterprise fund. And conversely, funds that were previously governmental or enterprise could now be considered fiduciary. So also consider the fact that there are potential general ledger and financial reporting impacts. You could now need to amend your chart of accounts to add accounts for additions or deductions in your custodial funds, as well as adding a financial statement for the statement of changes in fiduciary net position. And there could also be potential budgetary impacts if a fund changes from fiduciary to governmental or vice versa. In planning for implementation, put together a game plan. Go through and read Gatsby Statement 84, as well as the implementation guide that's specific to 84. Go through and identify any activities or funds that you think will require analysis and gather any needed documents. You may have to look at things like trust agreements. Maybe you have scholarship funds or reported in a private purpose trust fund, but you're not sure if they're even established through a trust. So go through and gather trust agreements, contracts, originating documents, analyze those activities and funds and make determinations based on the criteria that we've talked about today. Make sure that you discuss this with your auditor so that you're on the same page. Don't wait until the auditors come out for your 2020 auditor audits to start talking about this and thinking about this. The time to think about the changes is now. So make necessary changes in your general ledger and financial reporting system. And again, start now. One final note that I'd like to throw out there before we wrap things up is that changes to conform the provisions of GASB 84 should be applied retroactively by restating the financial statements if practicable for all years that are presented. But if this isn't practicable, you would report the cumulative effect of providing, I'm sorry, of applying the provisions as a restatement of beginning net position or fund balance. And one other thing to note is in the first year of implementation, a footnote should be added to disclose the nature of the restatement and also look through your significant accounting policies because the definitions of your fiduciary fund types may have changed as well as the addition of custodial funds. Okay, we have one final audience poll. All right. This very last question is, what topics would you like to see further webinars covered? A, GASB 87, which addresses leases. B, a GASB update, a high-level overview of upcoming pronouncements. C, the 2018 Yellow Book, or D, Uniform Guidance Update. Okay, the results are in, and it looks like a GASB update was the winner, 59%, and then GASB 87 coming in a close second at 57%. Okay, well, we appreciate your input, and um, we'll definitely take that into consideration as this is the, the first in our series of government webinars that we hope to roll out, and uh, we will definitely take those into consideration as we develop topics for our next webinar. Before we conclude today, we did have two questions that I'd like to share. Um, the first one was regarding student activity funds. If the faculty advisor is making the decisions, do the students have offices or is there any sort of documentation that the students make the decision for the money? If the faculty advisors are making the decisions, I'm sorry, in student activity advisors? Are the student yes. activity advisors part of the, the school district, the government? 
uh, I guess we would have to look into the situation again uh, with administrative involvement we would have to look at the situation of whether or not there are any specific guidelines that are established by the the school itself if the school is the actual reporting entity and whether they have to adhere to those specific guidelines and the faculty advisor is making determinations on the eligibility of these expenditures based on those specific guidelines uh, that that would be the the biggest determinant of whether or not there's administrative involvement uh, again also we would have to look at the situation of whether or not that faculty advisor is just basically interpreting uh, spending policies or of the clubs or activities themselves. Thanks, John. The second question says, are, are county's investments in external pools like text pool considered as investment trust funds and to be included as fiduciary funds? Are the county's external investment pools? They're asking if investment pools should be included. And the answer is no. No. Yeah. The answer to that question is no. Thank you. Thank you again for joining today's webinar. You will receive an evaluation request in your Outlook email box from Checkpoint Learning. Please complete it as we rely on your feedback to help us evaluate the effectiveness of our courses. Thank you again. Have a good afternoon. I think it'd be good.